Hi, welcome back to the second part. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate Jan for his first panel. It was oh. really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was really good. And we are very proud to kick off the second part with today's conference. Gael, are you looking forward to the second panel? I'm really excited to know more about the regulatory framework. Regulation has been mentioned a lot of times yeah. this morning. Yeah, it's, it's a really innovation and regulation is our key messages today. So we are really looking forward to it. But before we're kicking off the second part, we are very, very proud for some words of encouragement from Dorothee Beer, our German Minister of State for Digitization. Please roll the clip. Ladies and gentlemen, Albert Einstein said, more than the past, I'm interested in the future because that's where I intend to live. AI and Europe are two themes that will decisively shape our future. Together, they stand for much of what I personally believe makes a future worth living in. Progress, sovereignty, solidarity. And I would therefore like to thank you very much for the invitation to give a statement at today's event. Whenever I hear Albert Einstein's quote, I would like to add, we will also find key answers to today's challenges only with future-oriented thinking, with future technologies, novel ideas, and the courage to change. The COVID-19 crisis has made this crystal clear. We have witnessed how digital technologies and state-of-the-art AI applications can help us overcome this and future crises. It was algorithms that first warned of the COVID-19 pandemic. Using AI, the time a doctor needs to diagnose COVID-19 in a lung scan could be reduced from 30 minutes to 5 minutes. Not least, AI is able to screen millions of molecules for suitable drug candidates in just a few days, and thus brings us much closer to a medical sol solution to the crisis. On the other hand, COVID-19 has held up a mirror to us when it comes to digital transformation. We have seen how much still needs to be done with regard to digital infrastructure, tools and competences, for example, in schools and universities. And above all, we have been made aware that no country alone can solve challenges of this dimension and how important a joint international and European response is. Consequently, one of the main themes for the German EU presidency is a united, competitive and digitally sovereign Europe. Our goal is to make Germany and Europe a leading location for critical technologies such as AI or quantum technologies. We have made important steps along the way. With a white paper on AI, the EU Commission has put up a suitable frame for stimulating discussions. With our national AI strategy, we have significantly strengthened German AI research, boosted transfer to industry and expanded international cooperation. And nevertheless, AI has only partially reached the economy. SMEs in particular do not make enough use of the potential of AI. And so far, too few innovative AI applications made in EU turn into game changers on the world market. In Germany, we therefore decided to dedicate part of our economic stimulus package in response to the COVID-19 crisis to future topics and invest an additional 2 billion euros to take the development of AI to a new level. Our investments will directly pay on the strength of AI made in Europe and cover key areas which we want to discuss during our presidency. Let me mention three of those areas. First, innovation is at the heart of the question of how we intend to live in the future. My aim is to bring more beneficial AI applications made in Europe to the people. Therefore, we plan to establish world-leading AI ecosystems in key economic sectors in Germany, starting from excellent research and transfer structures. These AI ecosystems can then lay the foundation for a European AI network. Second, we must meet the growing demand for computing capacity and for accessible data pools in Germany and Europe. 
That is why we want to improve the access to computing power and bring our supercomputing infrastructure to an internationally competitive level. Use of data should be promoted and new data pools should be opened up for AI applications. To that end, we need to connect and scale up successful European initiatives. We also need to allow new players to cooperate to produce innovative data sets that haven't existed before. This is also the aim of our national data strategy. And third, we will stand up for a people-centered, reliable and at the same time innovation-friendly legal framework for AI in Europe. The federal government will shortly send its statement of the AI white paper to the EU Commission and point out central points in this direction. Ladies and gentlemen, our common goal should be to achieve decisive progress in all of the above areas. Together, we can bring more AI-based innovations to the people, set standards with competitive and secure data infrastructures, and establishing a trustworthy and innovation-friendly AI legal framework. With that, we would have done a lot for the future in which we and future generations intend to live in. So let's get started. Very, very interesting words by the German Minister Baer. Germans taking AI seriously as expected. What do you think, Gail? Yeah, I was very much struck also by the idea that we have to create new data pools, innovative data sets, and this is a good roadmap for our associations to connect all the stakeholders to create these data sets and make, as she said, Europe a leading location for AI technology. Yeah. yeah. We are very thankful and proud of our German State Minister for providing and also her whole team who uh, provided us this video clip and um, but it's not the only statement we have right now we have a second one yeah. yes yes we're very proud to announce the address by mr maro Shevchovich, the european commission's vice president so let's have a look at he, what he has to say good morning and my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today first because artificial intelligence is among those issues that must be addressed if europe is to make the most of its digital recovery. Second, with today being the final day of the Croatian presidency of the Council, it is the perfect moment to take stock of what has happened over the past six months and reflect on our future direction. Certainly, at the start of this year, nobody could have predicted the havoc which would be caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. These have been difficult times, but the determined efforts of the Croatian presidency and the Prime Minister Andrei Plenković are to be lauded, especially given that they also had to contend with the destructive earthquake which hit Zagreb in March. Across the European Union, we work together closely to tackle the immediate health challenges posed by the pandemic, ensuring that help reached the businesses and people who needed it uh, most as Europe went into lockdown. This need for cooperation must be reinforced now that we have shifted focus to the long term. Our joint efforts uh, now should focus on the far-reaching European recovery plan set out by the Commission last month, one based on solidarity, cohesion and convergence. It aims to kickstart the European economy, boost the twin green and digital transition and make Europe more resilient. Our proposals are based on an emergency European recovery instrument, Next Generation EU, amounting to 750 billion euros, as well as a reinforced multi-annual financial framework. In total, the leverage effect of these measures is set to generate an estimated total investment of 3.1 trillion euros. What is needed now is true leadership. Only swift political agreement can inject the necessary dynamism into recovery and long-term modernization of our economies. And only swift political agreement can send a clear message that Europe delivers and people and businesses can rely on our actions as well as on our words. But it is also important that we use this money wisely. The pandemic has not only left a trail of human suffering and economic devastation in its wake, 
it has also forced us to rethink how we need to plan for the future. That means learning and integrating the lessons from the crisis to respond effectively to a rapidly changing and increasingly volatile world. It means a paradigm shift in the way we do policy, carrying out an honest assessment of shortcomings so we can transform our vulnerabilities into opportunities. And it means that our actions should forge greater resilience in the EU and our member states. Our aim is not simply to bounce back to our pre-crisis state, but to advance towards the climate neutral, digital and the more resilient future. And this, in my view, is a core condition for a successful recovery. This autumn, we will adopt our first strategic foresight report, looking at resilience across the board with concrete case studies and a number of resilience indicators to help us monitor the continually evolving state of vulnerability and resilience capacities in our societies and make the more future-proof policy decisions. For example, the corona crisis has further highlighted the pressing need for Europe to bolster its strategic autonomy by building competitive, sustainable and resilient industrial value chains in key sectors, including the raw materials critical to game-changing clean and digital technologies. Here, we can build on our work under the European Battery Alliance aimed at creating a vibrant European battery ecosystem to reduce our over-dependence on Asia, notably China and South Korea, and we are well on track. After less than three years, the Alliance already encompasses over 300 industry and innovation actors and has mobilized around 100 billion euros in investment across the whole value chain. For these reasons, we have coined a blueprint for our 21st century industrial policy. It also applies to a stronger industrial and technological presence in strategic parts of the digital value chains. Therefore, our recovery investment should also be channeled towards strategic digital capacities and capabilities, including artificial intelligence. In this context, we need to help world-class innovators in Europe thrive by nourishing the ecosystems in which they work and by making it easier for them to bring radical new technologies to the market. For the perfect example of what Europe can achieve, both in terms of innovation and electromobility, you only need to look to one of my fellow speakers here today, an impressive innovator, Mate Rimac. So whilst there remains a great deal of work ahead of us, Europe can look to the future with confidence and a clear vision. That future, of course, begins tomorrow with the German presidency of the Council, and I look forward to continuing with them the excellent work and cooperation we have enjoyed with our Croatian friends. Strategic foresight as a key enabler of resilience will be part of that cooperation. Let me now finish by wishing you all an interesting and informative forum. Thank you for this nice words of encouragement and positivity from Brussels. Absolutely, and I think uh, Mr. Shevchevich spoke a lot about the topics that we discussed at panel number one, especially the economic recovery and betting on AI and new technologies to be the way out of this. Don't you think, Gael? Yeah, I am really agree totally. All the countries nationally are elaborating some recovery plans, and we see that it's essential to have AI in the recovery plans, both on national and European level. Absolutely. How do we move on? Well, after one president, two vice presidencies of the commission, one state minister, I'm very proud to announce my personal president, Jörg Bienert from the German AI Association. I hope he goes on stage right now for the regulatory framework for AI on a European level. Jörg, are you there? Let's hope so. So he has to go on stage right now, waiting. So what we will do now is uh, probably the same thing we did at the first panel. We will allow our panelists and our moderator to go on stage. Hello, uh, welcome, Jörg. It's my president. Hi, Jörg. Nice to see you. Hello to Croatia. Hello, Gal. Hi. That's really nice. Yes. So, Jörg. We have also, so for the, the audience, we still have our question tab. Jörg will look it up, I will, or I will send it uh, to him also that uh, in the panel we can get the audience questions also in but Jörg it's your panel please start it off thank you 
Yeah, thank you very much and welcome to the virtual panel session exploring a European regulatory framework for AI. Um, my name is Jörg Bienert. I'm the president of the German AI Association. Uh, this association was founded in 2018 with the goal to support the development uh, of AI in Germany and in Europe. And uh, together with our more than 240 members, uh, we have achieved quite a lot during the last uh, two and a half years. And all of these 240 members are tech companies that are really focusing on the development uh, of AI applications and AI technology. So I'm very happy that in the next 75 mini minutes, we are able to discuss a very important topic together with international experts from politics uh, and industry and startups. So welcome uh, on the panel, uh, Lucilla Scioli. She's director of AI and digital industry at the European Commission. Then we have uh, Christelle Fiorina, coordinator of the AI strategy for the economy at the French Ministry, uh, Ministry of Economy. And uh, we have an entrepreneur, uh, Mislav Malenica. He is founder and CEO of Mindsmith. And on the other hand, he's also president uh, of our partner association, the Cro Croatian AI Association. And um, I would like to, to start uh, with a round of introductory statements and would like to ask our panelists also to give a more uh, detailed introduction to, uh, to themselves. Uh, and I would like to hand over to Lucilla. So uh, Lucilla, what's your view on uh, AI, how we can foster innovation and what's the role of uh, regu uh, regulatory framework uh, and the uh, European AI white paper? Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much and good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, early afternoon. Uh, so I'm Lucilla Siori. I'm Director for Artificial Intelligence and Digital Industry at DG Connect of the European Commission. DG Connect is one of the departments of the European Commission that deals with um, basically policies concerning the, um, concerning the Internet. And, uh, um, uh, of course, artificial intelligence is one of our main policies. And uh, it is a very important policy because it has a very positive impact for, for consumers, for the economy, so therefore for business, for the public interest. There have been estimates uh, about the economic impact of artificial intelligence, maybe a little bit exaggerated in my opinion, but still it's, a, it's artificial intelligence in application that applies in a whole variety of sectors from agriculture to financial. Um, however, artificial intelligence is a technology that presents some risk. It presents some risk because uh, most of the uh, artificial intelligence approaches nowadays are, are based on machine learning. And this particular approach create, has some characteristics in terms of opacity, complexity. Uh, the system learns from the data set, uh, so the data set is biased, the outcome may be biased, the outcome may be depend on the way the algorithm has been designed. It's not clear how the final uh, you know, implementation of the activity of the system uh, was actually decided. So there are some, some concerns about the use of artificial intelligence in society because if we are not able to explain how a certain decision or a certain step is taken, we may risk violate some of our fundamental legislative principles that we have in our society, in particular the fundamental rights, which are enshrined in our European legislation. Um, so it is for this reason that... Sorry guys, sorry guys. Uh, Lucilla, um, or any one of you who has her cell phone pretty near her microphone, please switch it off because we have a little techno um, yes. insert in there yes, uh, yes, yes. and uh, we would be very thankful. And it's, that, uh, it would be too uh, bad for... For uh, us uh, not to hear you. So we... Yes. Sorry for the, uh, for the disturbance, but um, it was a little too dominant. And now, uh, and then when, when Lucilla is back, we also stop talking. <laughs> okay. Excuse us so much for the interruption. No, I moved it. It was probably mine, so yeah. I moved it. Thank you so much. Please enjoy. Um, Please enjoy. And um, so, 
um, so, so, so this is an issue that we have uh, with uh, with certain approaches. But uh, and this is the reason why we need uh, uh, a policy framework for artificial intelligence. Uh, something that, on the one hand, uh, helps us invest in artificial intelligence, being developers of artificial intelligence, and on the other hand, being uh, users of artificial intelligence. So we have published, uh, first of all, a data strategy that looks at how we can have access to greater pools of data in the European Union in different fields, as was also mentioned in the minister earlier. And then we have published a white paper on artificial intelligence, which looks both at actions to foster an ecosystem of excellence, meaning actions to foster research, to foster experimentation in artificial intelligence, to foster skills development, to make sure that artificial intelligence is actually developed in the European Union, and an ecosystem of trust to make sure that users of artificial intelligence not only are skilled in the use of artificial intelligence, but they also trust the systems they have to use. And, uh, and this is what has brought us to the reflection on a regulatory framework for artificial intelligence. We have used the work of a high level group of experts, uh, which has delivered principles for artificial intelligence. You may say there are many principles around, but they have also offered uh, an assessment list, so they have operationalized these principles. They have offered, they have transformed them into a checklist that the developers of artificial intelligence can actually use to make sure their developments are trustworthy. And on the basis of this work, we have made a proposal for a regulatory framework, where on the one hand we propose a principle-based regulatory framework risk-based, so we are only interested in addressing uh, artificial intelligence applications that have high levels of risk, and we are interested in applying requirements such as transparency, such as human oversight, such as robustness and accuracy, to make sure that uh, the developments are trustworthy. And then we have to think of the implementation mode. Do we need to check these uh, criteria, these characteristics before the system is put on the market? Is it enough to just check it ex post in case there is harm taking place? Um, uh, or should we simply put in place a voluntary labeling system where developers decide voluntarily to uh, certify their system and therefore also play a little bit with the reputational effect, which could actually help a lot of European companies? So the white paper has been presented, it's been on public consultation. Consultation is closed since 15th of June. We have received lots and lots of replies, more than 1,200, and we're in the process of analyzing them, and we should come forward with our proposals at the end of the year, beginning of 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucilla. And uh, I now would like to hand over to Crystal and uh, hear a little bit about your experience in that area, uh, your profile, and uh, your, init your initial thoughts. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be there and to to be able to talk with you about uh, this um, this common theme of uh, of a regulatory framework. I'm Crystal Fiorina. I'm the coordinator of uh, the economic strategy in AA. So in France, we have a national strategy that has been announced by our president in March uh, 20, uh, 2018. And then we have um, uh, an interim ministerial coordination and I'm the coordinator for economy. We have also a coordinator for research and a coordinator for other parts of uh, uh, the national coordination, and we have the inter inter the national coordinator, which uh, lead the national strategy for all the ministries in uh, in France. Um, I work for the Ministry uh, of Economy, so I have strong links, links with the, the economic uh, topics and with the enterprises in France. And uh, I'm the Sherpa in the, the coordinate, coordinated plane of the European uh, Commission. Um, the feel we have about um, AA in Europe is that, first of all, we have to uh, accelerate the, the innovation in, uh, in Europe. We have um, 
a strong technologies in Europe, strong, very good startups that provide the very high skill technologies. But for the moment, uh, they have difficulties to uh, to scale, first of all. And uh, they have also difficulties to, uh, to develop uh, their market in Europe because uh, for the moment the market is still fragmented and also to ad address their technologies uh, outside of Europe. So we think that first of all we have to uh, collaborate in Europe on um, an industrial strategy in AA uh, with all member states and the, the European Commission so that to uh, help our startups to, to develop uh, and to scale in Europe and to address other markets, especially uh, in the, the, the markets that are in a very high development. Uh, secondly, we think that, um, yes, the, the economical situation, the, the current situation is a constraint uh, and it was not planned. But also we have now to, uh, to get opportunities uh, in fact, to accelerate the transformation uh, in AA of our industries, in products and services with um, European technologies that can uh, help enterprises to, to have, um, to, to gain competitiveness on the markets and especially on the global markets using technologies made in Europe, as it was said this morning, and uh, using technologies that uh, correspond to our values in Europe. And um, because we have, and it's the third point, we have, uh, we have to build and we have begin, begun to build a third way of creating an AA between China and US. We have, as uh, Lucia said, an AA based on the respect of human rights, uh, an AA uh, based on ethic, and uh, based also on the, 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 the rights of the consumers. And I think we have to, uh, uh, to, to, to go further the, this vision, to, to, to build it as a labelized uh, uh, condition um, and a signal to the market to say that, yes, the technologies uh, produced in Europe are the, the technologies that will respect the fundamental rights of people and will respect ethics. Um, maybe, as you know, uh, France and Canada has launched an initiative which, which name is uh, GPI, Global Partnership in AA. There are many people, in many European countries that are, uh, that are uh, involved in that, that initiative. The European Commission also is involved in this initiative. I think we, we can go further and Europe can be a leader in the, this, this way in JPA promoting the ethic aspects of AA. Um, at least I would like to say that we have also in Europe to, to uh, design uh, an economy of the data. Uh, the, da the data economy is a, is a pillar of our uh, national strategy. We have a lot of data in Europe, uh, but the problem is that uh, the data is not uh, enough shared, uh, especially in the, the private sector. That's why I think we can also, uh, in the next uh, months and in the next year, have um, a public initiative to, uh, to help enterprises to share data and to design projects and build projects based on the utilization of data and mutualization of data in order to develop technologies. Because with that data, we won't have the opportunities to, uh, to, uh, be, uh, to challenge the, the markets um, in the, the global market in, in, uh, in AA. Thank you very much, Crystal. And uh, now let's come to uh, Mislav. Uh, I'm very interesting to, interested to hear uh, your view on this as an entrepreneur. And maybe you can uh, start uh, a little bit with explaining what your startup does. OK, great. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, I'm in love with uh, AI for more than 16 years first as a scientist and now as an entrepreneur. And our startup Mindsmiths uh, is based on like one hypothesis that we be, believe that one of the most important benefits of AI is the democratization of knowledge. 
which means that it should not matter who you are, what's the color of your skin, where are you from, you should have access to the best medical, financial, or any other advice. So basically what we do, we are designing emotionally intelligent digital experts that help people make better decisions and lead, lead basically more fulfilling lives. And I would say that uh, maybe to brag a little bit, our latest achievement is the digital assistant Tandavia that enables Croatian government and our medical institutions to effectively advise our citizens during uh, COVID-19 pandem pandemic. So in a situation where we are still waiting for a vaccine or a cure, where we are afraid that our healthcare system will get overwhelmed, Andrea's job is basically to calm down, to educate, to show that uh, no matter how hard the situation is, there's always a plan. And after the introduction of Andrea, calls to our coronavirus hotlines dropped for more than 25%, so it was like a pretty big success. But it also draws some of the questions about uh, moral uh, ethicity of it, like uh, can an algorithm actually make uh, decisions, should someone visit an ER or not, and so on. And that, that's something that also inspires me to join these kind of conversations. And that's why I think that uh, the regulatory framework is necessary and important, because we all should uh, recognize that we're all together in this. And I find, I personally uh, see this uh, framework as a, as a social contract where we all together agree on what we think makes sense for everyone. And then you have a problem if entrepreneurs don't take part in this dialogue, there's a chance that this social contract will actually be out of the balance and that it will do more harm than, than good. So I think it's our obligation, like startups, entrepreneurs, SMEs, uh, basically to share, to get involved, to share our perspective and help setting up an inspiring environment for exploring basically how AI can actually improve our lives. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. Uh... No, I had to unmute my... Myself. Thank you very much. Um, and before we look in, uh, a little bit more into the role uh, and uh, pros and cons of regulation, I would like to start a first dis uh, discussion round regarding the chances of AI and what we have to do uh, to foster the usage of AI within Europe. And I have my qu first question uh, to Lucilla. Um, in regards of uh, the conditions that have to be designed uh, in an economy of innovation in the area of, of Euro, uh, in the area of AI in Europe, uh, what can uh, the European Commission do? Uh, what are the means and measures uh, in order to foster the usage of AI in, in Europe and to stay competitive? Mm. The, the main uh, activities that we undertake uh, to support the development and the use of artificial intelligence are included, as I said, in the, in the white book, uh, in particular under the ecosystem of, of excellence, where we highlight, first of all, the very important role of research in artificial intelligence. And European Union and researchers in European Union are quite strong. Uh, we have, uh, you know, probably the highest number of publications, if you add up the publications published in the European Union. What we need to do is to, on the one hand, foster more collaboration. And to do that, we have created, through recent calls of the, the framework pro program, uh, we have created research networks of, uh, you know, excellence, research networks of excellence in research. And we have created four networks in the European Union where all the major practitioners and developers are participating in. Secondly, we have to bridge between research and industrial world because we want to foster demand and use in industry, uh, whether it's manufacturing or retail, it's uh, equally important. Artificial intelligence, as I said earlier, applied in all sorts of fields. And we are setting up a new instrument, a public-private partnership that will be financed through Horizon Europe, which will look at artificial intelligence, data, and robotics. And finally, we have to support, we have to facilitate the transition of innovation to the market. 
And for that, we are supporting through a new program called the Digital Euro Program. We are supporting the setup of testing and experimentation facilities, which are basically facilities in specific areas, for example, a smart hospital, for example, where uh, developers of AI for uh, uh, healthcare applications can uh, test their, their developments in a, um, almost a real environment. And that should facilitate uh, uh, the, the way they can then transition with their developments to the market and where they can probably also apply regulatory sandboxes and test whether there are better regulatory environments that we can foster in the European Union. Last but not least, we need to foster skills. We need to foster the ability of people to use artificial intelligence uh, in general. So introduce prog programming in all the faculties so the doctors also know what artificial intelligence is because they will have to use it. They may not have to program it, but they will have to use it. And, and secondly, make sure that we retain talent in the European Union, that we don't have our talent run away. And I think that more in collaboration between research and industry will also help to that effect. Thank you very much, Lucilla. Uh, so, Crystal, what are, from your point of view, in France and uh, also in regards to the European market, the most important uh, innovations that uh, we have to support and, and what measures are you taking? Uh, in France, we do support the, the idea to have a European net network of excellence, uh, as it was said by, by Lucilla, be because um, uh, we think that uh, we must create an, innova uh, an innovative, an innovative, friendly uh, environment in Europe, attract attracting talents, not only in research, but also in companies in Europe. Because uh, one challenge to today in France, for instance, is to uh, uh, recruit talents, uh, for instance, in big company that uh, that not provide technologies, but are that are in demand of uh, technologies, and also to recruit uh, talents in uh, in research and to maintain them in France. So I think that uh, uh, this challenge is the same in Europe. Um, about this network, ne excellent ne network, we think that uh, yes, it. it it cannot be only focused on research, but we have also to bring to 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 bridge it between uh, research, industry, innovation, and transformation of uh, the industry. So it has to be uh, based on sir, uh, the the research at first, but also uh, he this these networks have to, have to promote the transformation of every industry that 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 can be concerned by uh, by the DAA transformation. Uh, that's why it, can, it, it it has to be very applicative, in fact, at least, and um, with policies addressed to the to to the industry uh, and also for the services. Uh, for us in France, the condition of uh, the innovation um, is also to have huge investment in that domain, and we think that uh, events. There are investment uh, uh, planned in digital Europe, but it's not. Uh, the investment can, cannot be uh, only from the European uh, uh, Commission. It, we need also to uh, have investment in member states and to build a common uh, European investment based on AA with a common strategy on that. Uh, that's why. Um, we think that it's could it could be very uh, interesting to have a strategic roadmap at the European level based on excellent centers and also investment in uh, enterprises to help to uh, develop and promote uh, the AA made in Europe and um, also to have a common strategy to help our enterprises that are uh, uh, in need of competitiveness, especially in that situation of crisis, help them uh, to uh, integrate AA in their process with um, especially for uh, ECMEs with uh, a strong politic of investment in that uh, in that enterprises. We also think that we have key markets and key sector um, in in uh, which the inv investment are uh, can be focused. Uh, we see that at the Euro European level such sectors like uh, agriculture, uh, the ecological transition, 
uh, transport, mobility, cybersecurity can be uh, sectors that uh, that uh, on on on, the, on which we can focus uh, with our policies. And um, and we think also that uh, the the investment in AI cannot only be a public investment. So as it was said, we are uh, supporting the polit the the. Uh, the politics about uh, promoting private and public investment. Uh, for instance, we we can promote uh, PPP investment in data sharing or uh, in um, uh, disrupting technologies. And uh, we also think that on the European level, it could be interesting to uh, launch, for instance, an important project of common European interest on AA. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Mislav, you as an entrepreneur, uh, what does the ideal combina uh, collaboration between an entrepreneur and uh, government look like? So what uh, is your experience uh, with uh, the Croatian government? Uh, what is working uh, well? Where is room for improvement? And have you been able to interact uh, on a European level as well? Well, I would say that we should first make if you're trying to build an AI company, the first thing that you realize that these processes of like digitalization and AI, they favor only companies that are targeting global markets. But because like that's the moment when you'll have enough clients, enough data to reach these high levels of efficiency that you that will make you relevant, competitive, and sustainable in the in the long run. And I think what we all can see is that countries who do not realize that their job is actually to support their entrepreneurs in scaling up will be the countries that will end up in the defensive mode and they'll end up actually basically importing everything. But on the other side, you also have entrepreneurs who are not realizing that for great innovations, it's almost impossible that you do such things without collaboration with the regulator because you will, uh, otherwise you'll lack maneuverable space. And what I see as, as, as the biggest issue uh, here in Croatia, and maybe like uh, I would even apply it for the, for the rest of the Europe, is that we don't have this culture of dialogue where we feel good about asking for help and saying, look, we have an idea, we see, uh, see an opportunity and we need to help to actually realize it and to scale it up and to offer it to the rest of the world. And I'm not saying that sometimes it's not happening. I'm just saying that I don't see it systematically happening. And uh, that's like basically the, 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 the place where I see that we can improve the most is basically building all this culture of dialogue, uh, convincing governments that their job is actually to invest because if they invest into something that will scale up and be offered to the rest of the world, it will open new jobs. It will like uh, it will create a lot of opportunities for the country. And collaboration with Croatian government, I would say it was very very interesting. It was like first time for for us, and um, it wasn't easy because. Uh, we, as like a group of people that were involved in that, like several companies, we had to learn a lot about how to do business with the government. It's not the same if you're directly partnering with other companies. But I would say it was a very cool learning experience, and we are hoping that we'll actually find and set up a recipe for actually doing it more often. Because I don't think that any any company in the world right now who really wants to be dominant in, on the global market can actually do it without really good support from their local market and I would even like apply for, for the for the rest of the EU. Thank you very much, Ms. Love. So let's uh, switch to the general topic of uh, the role, uh, the pros and cons of a regulatory, regulatory framework. And in order to do so, I would first of all like to uh, pick up a question uh, that remained from the previous session, from the previous panel. Uh, which uh, could be a good introduction into this topic. And I would uh, hand over this question to all of you. And the question was, uh, what actions are being taken to promote trust in AI? Are you planning on having a body of governance to ensure responsible AI, practi AI practices 
are followed to unethical bi and bias in AI solutions in Europe. So um, maybe Crystal, you could start, and then we would uh, to answer this uh, question briefly, and then we will hand over to the other ones. Yes. Um. Speaking about uh, ethics, uh, effectively, uh, we are we are currently uh, working on on uh, the ethical aspects of AI. Um, there are two points I think, uh, and if, if we have to link it to the regulatory framework, I think at first the the, the, the white paper of the Commission Europe, the, the European Commission. Um, uh, Identify the the criticism system as um, the one uh, to be regulated, and we think that uh, this approach is the good one uh, because we, if you speak about uh, health or uh, autonomous driving, you see that uh, uh, we have very uh, sensitive uh, uh, technologies on that, and they have to be re uh, regulated uh, because you. At, at the moment, there is a question of uh, life, life or death. So, uh, focus the the regulatory framework on the the, the criticism criticism application is the we think a good a good solution. But also, and it's a question we have in France. We see that uh, many applications in uh, B two C uh, business to consumer had uh, had some problems uh, and. Uh, uh, had some bias. For instance, we, we see that some applications on social network or applications for the recruitment uh, can be uh, can can have a lot of bias that uh, gender bias, uh, discrimination bias based on the on the the, the ethnic or the uh, or on the age or, or so on. And we think that. On that kind of application, we can also have a, a reflection to uh, to regulate B two C application that uh, that demonstrated that uh, they they can raise some uh, ethical uh, problems, and uh, it, we think that we can uh, we can do with this kind of approach in uh, in Europe. Um, speaking about regula regulation, we can also. We, we must have a balanced approach between innovation and regulation and uh, especially for uh, startups in Europe that can that have to innovate and uh, we think that the, the regulatory framework has uh, to be built to respond to a strong question to respond to risks because we analyze risk we have questions to face uh, in AA so we have to be very very uh, careful about not uh, uh, reducing the capacity of innovation of our enterprises, building a framework that could not be fit to their activity. That's why, at first, speaking about ethics and uh, especially regulation, we think that uh, regulate uh, criticism aspects is a is a good approach. But we can also go further, especially in some B two C application that seems uh, that that. Where, where, where there is a risk to have some uh, some bias and discrimination, as uh, as I said, it's recruitment are also on networks and that's that's it. Uh, Azo, sorry, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe also the question to you: uh, uh, Despite the regulation, what can AI companies and especially startups do in order to uh, uh, increase the trust in AI applications? So I, I would love to uh, a little bit re uh, to reflect what I've heard so far. I think that maybe one of uh, one of the important topics actually to, to discuss is like how much time we are actually spending on talking about the packaging and the form and how much is actually spent about uh, on the content because i don't think that in 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 europe we have a huge messy market with like thousands of ai startups and no one actually knows what's going on and what's happening and now we are looking for a way actually how to improve it i would say that uh 
it's it's a little bit strange to me that usually you have like tech innovation you have disruption and then you find best practices and then you basically try to systemize that in in, in some form of some regulation and it seems to me that we are trying to create laws and regulatory framework before we actually created the market and if i can get back to the to the question that, uh, that the person asked do we need another government body that will actually control something i think it's a super important question but that's in my opinion a wrong way how to address it the right way would be to educate people what the bias is to educate them to ask for solutions that are actually solving and uh, uh, these kind of problems not to add a new layer of regulation but because that's something that really increases the cost of innovation and one of the reasons when you as an entrepreneur are trying to uh, identify what's the market where you want to start your company you'll just see like how heavy the regulation is uh, do you understand it how often it changes is is it supportive you know for innovative uh, products or it's basically constantly trying to paralyze you with fears that maybe are not even real so in, in my opinion i think that we should be a very realistic and say that number of ai startups is in europe is relatively low because it's a market of like 450 million people pretty big market not a great output and instead of actually uh, going deep and analyzing why is it like that how we can actually motivate more people and create more inspiring environment we are trying even like to put more burden on on, on this and don't get me wrong i'm not against regulation i think when done right that's what provides you stability and that's awesome i just think that we are like one step behind where we think we are and that we need to find a way how to actually motivate uh, the market and, and entrepreneurs actually to start the companies Thank you very much, Ms. Love. So, Lochila, what, what, what would be your answer uh, to Ms. Love's concerns? And uh, I would also like to pick up a question from Sheila. You are uh, you there? Uh, are you planning on having a body of governance to monitor and ensure responsible AI practices uh, that are followed to avoid unethical and bias in AI solutions? That uh, you know, most of the developments in AI truly nowadays are probably taking place in China and the United States. This is when you talk about AI, these are the areas of the world that are proposed as the leading areas. But as a citizen, uh, you know, if I look at their digital world and I look at the digital world in the European Union, I'm very happy to live in the European Union. We have seen this now with, with COVID. Uh, look at what happened with the tracing apps. Uh, we have been, uh, you know, many European countries have been discussing the implementation of the apps, which will need to be interoperable, but most of the discussions have been about privacy. Now, I think most of European countries do have a tracing app or they're about to introduce it. I think there is only two or three who will not, um, and they will be interoperable. You look at other parts of the world where, because they don't have GDPR, because they have not been thinking about privacy, they're not able to implement them. And they would rather suggest that having people that physically follow other people and check if they're sick or not. So I think that what COVID has taught me, for example, is that Europeans care a lot about their fundamental rights. Certainly they care a lot about their privacy. And in my opinion, they also care a lot, care a lot about not being discriminated. So in gender, in all the, the reasons that were listed by Christelle earlier. So I, I really think that uh, we need to be able to build a regulatory framework that is targeted, as I said, high risk in the areas where people really care about. Um, and uh, I don't think this will, uh, I think we can, we can find ways to make sure that this does not stifle innovation. For example, in the white paper, we have proposed for small, medium enterprises and startups the help of organizations which already exist. 
They're called digital innovation hubs. We are asking, you know, we're putting them in place with the member states. They will be in place starting from the beginning of next year. We ask one, at least one per country to be in particular specialized in artificial intelligence. We hope in large countries there will be more than one. And this can help, for example, the, the startups and the smaller enterprises to really reduce the cost if they're really developing applications in areas that are considered high risk. But we do have to find a way to make sure that we have a mechanism in place whereby the use of artificial intelligence does not violate fundamental rights and we have no way of realizing it. And I think these are the values of the European Union and that's what makes us different from maybe other parts of the world. Other part, the developers in other parts of the world will be required to put in place the same requirements that we do, like we do with GDPR. They have to put in place the same requirements. They're not alleviated because they're not Europeans. And we also hope that European companies can take this angle of trustworthy for being a competitive advantage rather than a disadvantage. So, so Lucilla, if I, if, uh, if I may ask like, a few questions. Yeah. So first, I really love our human-centric focus. I really think it's our great opportunity on the global market. I really love the fact that we are not betraying our European values. So I think that, will, that can be our product that can be scaled across the globe and that other nations will also appreciate it, that human-centric approach. So I'm not questioning that. I'm questioning uh, to what's in my mind a fact is that I don't think that right now anyone knows how to actually regulate high risk uh, industries like healthcare. I think that there is like a lot of people that can maybe think that they can actually do it, but I don't see practices. And when I'm trying to analyze how innovation actually and disruption happens ar around the world, it's not by first setting up regulation, which implies that there's someone who is so smart that can see the future and knows already the right steps. It usually starts with some experimentation, something that can go in the sandbox, something that can go in the control environments and so on. And then when you learn something, what works and what doesn't work, then you actually put it in, in, into the legal or regulatory framework. And I just feel that we are actually spending so much time and energy on trying to predict what will be the right formula without like really actually having any tools to be able to predict what it will be. And it's not based on experiences because AI is something really new, coexistence of like humans and AI and how the world will evolve. That's something that we need to see what will happen. And I'm just thinking that if we put too much burden, basically we'll actually push out innovators uh, uh, out of the Europe, not because we are not caring about our human-centric approach and our core values. We love that. It's just because it drains your energy to spend so much time on, on frameworks that basically I, I just don't see how they can be made well with uh, knowing as little as we know right now. So my, my question is like, where do you find like the confidence that we can actually build a, a very specific regulatory framework for a lot of industries where basically we don't have best practices at the moment? Well, what I, if I can answer now, where I find uh, the confidence uh, is uh, in the fact that we are still building the governance model, and maybe this refers back also to the question that was raised. Um, you should not think uh, of a regulatory framework as being necessarily always a static framework. You can think of a framework where you can start identifying, for example, areas of concern. I will give you an example. Take healthcare again. You take medical devices. There is already a European legislation that says that you have to see and mark uh, the medical devices in terms of safety. Now, these medical devices include artificial intelligence at the moment. Many, much of this certification is carried out in terms of just checking if the software is safe. And there is nothing particularly specific on artificial intelligence. So here the idea could be that you introduce a system, a mechanism, um, in terms of checking the robustness and the accuracy of that artificial intelligence system that allows you to say, if in this area, which is, by the way, already regulated, 
when the software is actually an artificial intelligence system, would I have to check for something different compared to what I'm checking now? So you can start by looking at areas that are already regulated for safety reasons and see whether you need to improve the mechanisms that are currently in place. Secondly, you can think of identifying specific areas. I mean, I can tell you there is a lot of discussions on going on biometric identification, for example, because sometimes these systems make mistakes and small mistakes in these areas when used for mass surveillance, for example, or for criminal reasons can bring to huge and negative impacts on people's life. So the question is, we already have some regulation in GDPR with lots of exceptions. The question is, is that enough or should we have something more for biometric identification to make sure that the system is sound enough so that when it is used in these ways, it does not, you know, the, the, the probability that makes mistakes is very, very low. Or you can identify, we identified in the white paper recruitment because that is an area where a lot of people are, you know, concerned with. Is there a possibility that uh, we can make sure that the data set has been unbiased or that at least there is a way that a, a user can then contact a human person if he has a problem with that party. You know, the, a lot of these uh, job applications, uh, even in normal platforms we use every day, not just the recruitment, but also when people are looking for other people with specific profiles, can have very important impact on people's life. And this is the kind of things we would like to be able to capture. And it doesn't mean that next year in March, when we propose our framework, we have captured all the possible areas and there will be a fixed set of areas uh, that will last forever. But at least to be able to start from the ones that are considered the most problematic and maybe with time change on the base, as you say, of best practice, of knowledge, of um, you know, more use that, that will come about. So I fully agree with you, we shouldn't think of, and we're not able to come at once and say, this is the regulatory framework for AI, but we should build a system that allows us over time to keep these developments in a way a little bit more under control than they are now and avoid negative impacts on people's life, but for impacts that are really significant, so for very high risk applications. Yeah. Uh, Crystal, maybe you can comment on this and maybe we can extend this uh, view on one uh, in regards to one question that came from the audience. Uh, Walid Sacker asked, uh, when will Europe have groups like GAFAM, which means Google, Amazon, mm -hmm. Facebook, Apple and Microsoft or Baidu? Um, this leads also to the question, uh, Are we, are we to have a, a better regulatory framework, more quality standards uh, on AI and its applications? But on the other hand, the business is still done by uh, US and Chinese companies uh, because they have um, the more power in the market, they have the data, uh, and, and they have uh, the advance of, of, of not having to consider so much regulations. So, Crystal, uh, it's up to you. Yes. Well, as I said, I think we, we have to, to build uh, the third way between China and uh, USA uh, with an AA based on, on the respect of uh, human rights and, uh, and the, re the respect of uh, uh, the ethic. Uh, but we have also, on the other hand, the, the opportunity uh, to, to create an innovative, uh, a friendly, innovative uh, economy in Europe. That, that's why as I said, if we want to regulate uh, AA economy, we do we do have to think about what are the risks we had identified, and then what what are the answer we can find in a, a regulation. And uh, as I told you, uh, criticism criticism uh, system and uh, some B two C applications that uh, that lead it to uh, to uh, discrimination. Uh, can be a way to 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 be regulated, but uh, I think on the other hand that we have also to to uh, listen to the needs of enterprises in Europe, enterprises that provide technologies first, and also enterprises that have to uh, that need AI technologies to uh, to gain in competitivity. I want to say that we can also have uh, an initiative towards these enterprises to. Uh, promote ethics in AA, but on a voluntary uh, approach. 
for instance, in France, we have uh, the, the, the great enterprises uh, of industry, such as Thales, EDF, Total, Orange, and so on, that decided to uh, sign a manifest uh, of um, uh, Trust AA that uh, lead to a, a common uh, action plan and a common work map to develop uh, uh, an EA of uh, a, trust, a trust EA based on respect of uh, ethics and uh, human rights. It's a voluntary approach and we help them to, uh, to build this, uh, this roadmap that was signed last year with uh, the, the Ministry of Economy. And another approach could be also to develop volunteer labelization or certification on, or to go towards uh, certification or have a European strategy on normalization to create labels, certification that prove that the companies um, have guidelines and uh, respect uh, an ethic policy in designing their products and uh, their services. Next, if we speak about ethic, we must also in Europe have a level, a level playing field. A level playing field for the, the services and products that are sold, sold in Europe, but also for the ones that have been trained um, on in, country, in third countries that are, are not uh, concerned but, uh, about the, the legis legislation and Europe. That is to say that also in Europe, we have to think about our uh, poli policy of uh, uh, commerce with uh, other countries. And we have also to uh, say strongly that we want to have in Europe products that respect our way to think about AA the ethics aspect of AA, even if the if the technologies are not trained on the, the European ter territory. So I think that the level playing field is a is an approach we can uh, we can have uh, with other countries, especially uh, countries that uh, doesn't share our our values about uh, the respect of uh, human rights and, uh, for instance, democracy. Uh, thank but, you very much, Miss um, Love. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think it was like an awesome question. Like, when are we going to have Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and or Tencent or Alibaba? I would say that right now that's not part of our culture. And basically, if we analyze the last like twenty years and like what happened with the internet and the rise of the platforms, we are we are we were just not playing that game. And to me, it seems that we are maybe going heading in the same direction because it's not about that we have few companies and we are trying to give them competitive advantage in order actually to try to dominate the world market. We are constantly like talking about the form. And while we are talking about the form, someone else is actually producing all these solutions. And to me, for example, which, uh, what I find is a very good signal I first, I think that the white paper addresses like super important questions, like really super important. I think it's like very well written. It, I, I was like really impressed. But what really surprised me is that uh, the word startup in, in that white paper, which is pretty long, is actually mentioned only twice. And if we know that basically startups are like considered to be vehicles of innovation and disruption, I'm just thinking, wow, if they will be bringing this AI innovation to here and we want to support them, why they're not present in that document? And I find that document awesome for keeping status quo for big European companies, but I find it like very restricting for actually uh, fostering the growth of like uh, new startups that could have like new ideas and, and, and especially for smaller markets like Croatia. Because, for example, if you're coming for Croatia, you don't have a big industry that you can rely on. You can see that uh, AI is, a, is an opportunity that we probably won't have another one like that in like th 30 years. And we know that we need to take more risks to have a chance to be relevant on, on, on the global market. And the only thing that we cannot do is actually wait for some regulatory framework that's trying to predict future based on no data to happen. And although I think 
it's awesome that in Europe we have a culture where we discuss such things. I think we need to also be very uh, well aware that maybe our knowledge about application of AI and how it will affect our human lives is not actually that good at the moment so that we don't go too specific. We don't waste too much time. We actually add, uh, uh, we offer principles in the beginning and we ask people to be responsible for what they're doing. Because for me as an entrepreneur, it's easier to be for responsible for the good things that I'll do and the bad things that I'll do than to spend enormous amount of time, money and effort to try to be compliant with all the regulations that are actually happening. So, uh, Lochilla, how do we make sure that uh, uh, that startups can be successful in Europe? Uh, are they really important in regards to the white paper, to the strategy? And how do we avoid a situation uh, like the GDPR that uh, sometimes leads to a, a situation that uh, uh, small startups are struggling more with the GDPR than the big American companies like Google and Facebook? Well, I think that um, the, the, the startups are, are very important in Europe. Unfortunately, you know, the, the white paper uh, is written, it's like the fourth document in a series of documents on AI that started being written in 2018. And I'm sure that if you go back to the others, you'll see more mentions of startups, not because they have become less important, but because we have addressed uh, some specific actions on startups uh, in other places. For example, we have set up um, uh, with, uh, with the European Investment Fund, we have set up, uh, uh, we have contributed financially to, to a fund of fund for startups in AI. And this one is going very well. And uh, I am actually um, uh, very happy to, to notice that in the recovery package that was now proposed by the European Commission, uh, there has been an increase uh, in, the, in the funding of the financial instruments in InvestEU, which is really very much uh, about equity. And uh, actually, I think that the real advantage compared to current market condition is probably uh, in terms of equity. And so I think that could be can be extremely important uh, for the startups. I agree that this has not been uh, particularly highlighted in the white paper, but it's uh, um, a fund which is uh, at the moment already available with the European Investment Fund. And the idea is to strengthen it in the future with, uh, with InvestEU. So I also invite you to, to look at these other activities. It's very difficult for me sometimes when I describe the activities we do to be completely comprehensive because there are really many different areas that become relevant. And that's why I also don't like to talk about the regulatory framework in isolation. And I like to talk about all the activities we try to undertake to make sure that we can have a flourishing ecosystem. Now, I also understand the issue of the startup who says, I'm in Croatia, I have difficulties in connecting to companies in other parts of Europe. But this is what this is something where we have to work on collectively, including in the public private partnership I was mentioning earlier. And I, I hope you can also take part to those discussions because that will give you the possibility to connect to maybe even bigger companies in, in other parts of Europe. We don't have the big platforms, but we do have some platforms. We have Booking.com, we have, I don't know, Zalando, we have Skype was invented in Europe. And but the reason why they don't become, or they have not become as big as the others is because we traditionally, historically, have had a lack of a single market, in particular of a digital single market. So many European companies go to the United States to scale up and then they come back. And some don't come back at all, unfortunately. But this is what we've been trying to do in the European Commission with the proposals of the, the European Union in the past, uh, with the past Commission, uh, very much about strengthening the digital single market because it's the fragmentation of our market due to our geographical borders. Um, and we are not an integrated federation like the United States is. And that's what makes it more difficult for our companies to, to grow at the international level. But this is the real reason why the European Union exists. And I think that over time, we have been making incredible progress in all sorts of different fields, including in telecoms and other digital areas. So 
I hope we can continue doing that, but obviously um, the, the, the scale of the, the, the US market and the lack of fragmentation, the, uh, the, the, the availability of venture capital, uh, the, the, the existence of Silicon Valley, these are all reasons that have, of course, flourished a certain ecosystem that we have not achieved in the European Union. Not yet, but we are ready for the next phase. But, but if I can add to that, I would say that there's also another uh, another reason is like when you analyze how American or Chinese or Israeli government actually uh, collaborate with their entrepreneurs, they are seeing that, oh, I need to help my company because that's how I'm actually spreading my power across the world. And it's so obvious when you're actually doing business in those countries. And while here, I would say that we still are not recognizing that we need to invest in companies that can be globally dominant so that we have something to offer. So basically, we are constantly one step behind. We are thinking about, should we replicate the cloud infrastructure because we are dependent on it? Should we replicate this because we are dependent on it? We should, I would say, in my opinion, we should just recognize that we are late. We lost like few battles already. Uh, the bad thing that we can do is actually basically limit uh, our entrepreneurs actually access to the state of the art technology in the world right now because we want to promote something that's European because then we are actually making efficient entrepreneurs in Europe. And, and I would say it's more like a philosophy of each country and that's why I just want to repeat, I really like our human centric focus. I really like our European values and I think that can be a product that we can sell to the world but we just don't we are not focused uh, enough on like how to build businesses we are more focused on like how to uh, make sure that the world doesn't change so I would say that we are not inspired with what we can actually achieve and how the future can look like we are more par paralyzed by the fear oh, there, there's a mistake that can happen on the, along the way. And I think that anyone who's been an entrepreneur knows that mistakes always happen and they're part of the learning process. And I don't know why, but we are so afraid of the mistakes. And we are, instead of like embracing them and experimenting and then actually trying to see how we can touch the world, we are basically preventing the world of coming to us. Um, I, I also would like to pick up one additional question from the audience and, and talking about uh, uh, the different European countries. Uh, Nada Viale um, asked, uh, Lithu Lithuania is a country that progressed a lot in data-centric approaches and AI. Is there experience sharing on the subject with other European members? Uh, so, Christelle, are you exchanging best practices and ideas uh, with other European countries? And uh, do this idea get into uh, the, um, the thoughts uh, and the progress of further development of the framework uh, in the, uh, on the European Union side? Um, yes, so we have um, we have some cooperation, uh, strong cooperation with uh, countries like uh, Germany, of course, and uh, for instance Finland. And uh, that in that context, we we have reflection about uh, data sharing and also about uh, common projects in AA. About uh, data sharing, the most difficulty for the especially for the private actors is to have. Um, uh, confidence in the way uh, of uh, of the sharing in the in the way of uh, the the platform is is, is conceived to uh, to have uh, confidence between uh, in uh, in sharing data and use of data. Uh, so we are currently working on that with some other countries to to find what could be possible to uh, create confidence about uh, data sharing. Uh, for example, in France. Uh, in the sector of agriculture, which uh, which is a sector uh, with a lot of actors, uh, big actors and also a uh, little one, uh, like farmers, uh, we raised, uh, it's based on a private initiative, but uh, we raised um, a platform which name is uh, AgDataHub, 
And I think it's a it's a good example uh, to of uh, what kind of uh, common platform we can have on uh, sector on, on different sectors of uh, industries. Um, just one thing also about this: when you speak about uh, data economy and when you speak about uh, data sharing, you speak about innovation, and uh, obviously. Uh, our main problem, problem today in France, but also in Europe, is to uh, help our startups to uh, innovate, uh, to uh, have a friendly environment to innovate, and also to scale. That is to say that uh, for data, for AA, uh, we need to uh, create this environment, to enforce this environment, because in fact, uh, the environment is created, but to enforce it, to help them to scale in Europe and to, uh, to um, to have a common market because for the moment the market in Europe is still too uh, too fragmented. That is to say that we we have uh, to uh, to invest a lot uh, in uh, in innovation and to help and our enterprises to continue to innovate in uh, in Europe uh, because there is a strong public investment on that and a strong support. Um, I told you uh, I, I I took the example of the. Ag Data Hub, which, which is this platform of uh, data sharing in agriculture, there is a public support, a public fin financial support on that because we we launched a call for project for data sharing in France, and ob uh, obviously uh, we have some uh, uh, groupments of uh, actors that are willing to to share, but they need the support of uh, the state uh, in order to uh, bring other private actors on their initiative. That is to say, we cannot only focus on the regulatory framework. We, we must, at the beginning, have a strong investment, public investment, to uh, to uh, support actors to continue to innovate and to uh, have data to uh, to uh, train technologies. That's why we think that the the frame the regulatory framework has to be very progressive, as to uh, let uh, part to the initiative and experimentations and has to be associated with that investment, which, which for us is, is a public investment, but also a public investment to bring private investment on that sector. Thank you very much. Um, so picking up two, two last questions from the audience, uh, handing them over to Lucilla. Um, are cybersecurity uh, experts participating in defining some of the regulations? And do you think uh, open source uh, should be considered in the area of AI? Uh, bringing this into a, a larger framework uh, of what are the next steps in regards to the further development of the framework uh, and the European AI strategy? So uh, the next steps, um, I, as I highlighted before, we are in the process of analysis, analyzing the results of the public consultation. We had many, many contributions, so this is uh, quite a long work, although we will also be using artificial intelligence to help us. Uh, and the, the idea is to come forward with a proposal for a regulatory framework by the end of the year, beginning of next year which means uh, that then you know there is a discussion that will be ongoing with the other european institutions which are the council of member states and the european parliament um, in terms of uh, cyber security uh, yes there are experts of cyber security which have been part uh, which are part of the high level expert group on artificial intelligence we also speak uh, regularly with enisa which is the european agency on cyber security and of course, uh, the cybersecurity angle is very, very important also for the safety um, implications when we, when we deal with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, um, also when it's embedded in products. So um, uh, yes, yeah, cybersecurity is obviously a very important uh, element in our considerations in artificial intelligence. Um, I just would like to, to, to simply recall uh, that uh, um, th there are also a number of, of other initiatives that can help uh, uh, the smaller company. I'm thinking of the European initiatives on innovation procurement. This is very important also still for the startups to, um, uh, to be able to, to, to grow. 
um, on top of uh, funding, on top of uh, helping uh, accelerators and incubators in different European countries. There is a manifesto of European startups that has been developed and that it's uh, actually uh, updated with a certain regularity. And so we are trying from Russell's to put in place an ecosystem that can also help start startups. And once again, I would like to invite people to look at the regulatory framework as a way to ensure trust in a technology that sometimes doesn't and incentivize use because otherwise we risk also to negatively affect a demand which is, uh, uh, would then be penalizing all companies regardless of their size. Thank you. So we have five minutes left and I would like to finish it with a final round of questions regarding what are you envisioning for the future? So let's uh, be, move into the year 2025. Uh, what are, will we have achieved by then? Uh, what are chances, risks, and uh, what has to be done to uh, come to these achievements? And maybe let's start with uh, Mislav. Okay. So you said it's uh, the year 2030 or 2050. 2025. So just five. 2025. Years. Okay. I would say the the year is 2025. People on average still have 10 to 15 friends, close friends. And in 2025, not all of these people are real. Some of them are digital beings. And I find it like very inspiring. And I think that we'll, it will drive like a lot of ethics questions, moral questions and so on. But I think people will be able like to build relationships with with digital beings if they'll create value for, for them. And that's something, for example, that, expire, that inspires me personally. But in order to make any progress with, with the AI, I think it's all about the communication. And I think it's all about learning to ask for help from the government side, from the entrepreneur side. And that's the level of the dialogue I, uh, right now is not at the level that will actually create right conditions in Europe for innovation to happen. And I'm just like hoping that we'll have more of these uh, forums, more of these discussions, and that, and that through that we'll actually find a common path to, to the better future. Thank you. Crystal, uh, what's your view on 2025? Uh, have we caught up with uh, China and the US? Uh, where have you been uh, making uh, great achievements? Well, I often say that um, uh, when we speak about AA, we, we do not speak only about uh, technology, but uh, we speak about uh, culture and the choice of uh, civilization. Because at least uh, the AA will be uh, a part of all the process in the in industries, but not only. It will be uh, it will have development for the the social and uh, the environmental aspects. So, uh, my concern for twenty twenty five is to uh, to build this uh, third approach, the third way which is the, the European wa uh, way based on HETIC. And I think we can build it if we, if we bring the US companies in our approach and if we, with reg regulatory aspects, but not only, if we push them with, uh, with uh, support to innovation and investment to uh, get in this approach. And I think in that case, we will be able, yes, to, to to have this uh, trademark with uh, EIA uh, um, made in Europe and to be uh, competitive on the, the global market, which with this uh, this kind of approach, with, which will be very respectful from for uh, the human rights. I think it's a uh, it's a great challenge. I think it would be difficult, but I think we can, we we have to face this challenge now and no, not in in uh, in two or three months, but now. To, uh, to be uh, 
to make Europe as a leader of this way of con conceiving AA in 2025. Thank you very much. So I fully agree with uh, what uh, Christel has just said about the European way. We now sometimes in the Commission call it technological autonomy. You may have heard of this uh, expression. It does not mean that we don't want to import from other parts of the world. It simply means that we want to be able to develop technology and we want to be able to develop technology that has the characteristics that we want in terms of human centric, but also in terms of greener technologies. This is another very important objective of, of the European Union. And so we would like also artificial intelligence to be um, you know, used to, to achieve this objective, to be able to green itself a little bit and to be able, of course, to be used in applications that help to green our economy. Um, I also hope that uh, in 2025, we are much better than we are now at making sure that our capabilities in AI that are very clear in research are actually passed on to industry. We always say the United States, China are better, maybe, you know, for the platforms, but on things like manufacturing, car making, um, uh, some energy solutions, well, they're not. So we are pretty well placed ourselves in certain traditional sectors, including healthcare. And I think that we should be uh, also able to harness the benefits of artificial intelligence in these specific areas, which are our traditional industrial strongholds. And finally, I hope that in 2025, um, people you know, are much more educated about artificial intelligence, not only people at university, although you know the, the way education changes is very, very slow. So if we could have a change there in terms of multidisciplinarity, it would be very welcome. But also simply informing citizens more about technology and what it can do for you, and not just, of course, the scaring people about the concerns of technology. I think this is an important activity that we all collectively have to undertake. Just last one, one last point about 2025. I hope the European Union works as a union because there is no way we can compete with China and the United States. There is no single European country who can compete with China and the United States alone. We really need to have uh, to work together and have a coordinated effort uh, um, and the uh, European effort together. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think this were, were very good closing words. Uh, I think this is really something we should focus on. And uh, uh, yeah, we are uh, out of time right now, although there are a lot of topics that uh, might be quite interesting and which we wouldn't, haven't been able to cover. But I would like to thank you, uh, Christel, Lucilla, and Misla, for this uh, good and vibrant discussions. We have covered a lot. Thank you to the audience for your question. Uh, some of them we were able to answer, I hope, to your satisfaction. And uh, I think there are, uh, a lot, there's a lot of work ahead of us in order to, to come to these achievements. Uh, so the, these discussions uh, won't stop uh, during the next weeks. Uh, but now, uh, unfortunately, it's time to hand over again to my friends in Paris and Zagreb. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah. So we are back. Are we back? So we are back now. Thank you so much for this interesting panel and for, and we hope that we can continue this discussion about regulation and innovation. Thank you to all the panelists. Also, a special thanks to Jörg, who interrupted his, his vacation on the Lake of Starnberg to come um, the, virtually to Zagreb, Berlin, and everywhere around the world for moderating this panel. So I think we are on the end of panel two, and panel three starts in 50 minutes. Yes, we will do a switch again, as we did the last time. So here, you guys remember, you can do the switch here. We will start at 2 p.m. sharp with yep. our third panel, and we also have some keynote addresses by more uh, EU officials. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank, uh, thanks to everyone who participated in the questions and the chats. Uh, we really love to see the discussion going on. We love yeah. to see people networking, sharing their individual LinkedIn profiles. Please continue doing that, and uh, we'll see each other very soon. Thank you very much. Two o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.